It's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. It's the day before a Class 3 death storm, a snowpocalypse hits the Detroit area, but that's not going to stop the knee-jerk Detroit sports talk of Eno and Big L. I'm the Big Al of the equation, uh, Al Beaton, Detroit ba- longtime Detroit-based podcaster and blogger, who has been MIA for about a month because I was um, hanging out with retirees in Florida for a couple weeks. But holding down the fort here in Michigan, as always, is the man you know as Greg Eno, who knows a lot of things about a lot of things and has the Out of Bounds blog. Greg, it's been a while. It has. Are you are you seeing playing cards, de- decks of playing cards in your sleep? <laughs> I, play, I, 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 I have nightmares about, uh, about, about reneging playing Euchre at this point. That's how much cards I've played when I was... Cards is life in a retirement community, trust me. That and game shows. Watching game, game shows, shows and co- yeah. Uh, no, that's, my that's God. And golf and golf as well. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh it's nice to be back home, but it was also very nice seeing my, my dad and stepmom who are not getting any younger. My dad's eighty two now. So uh and actually I extended my stay. I mean, I was only gonna go for ten days. And it it was really funny. My when asked, Well, what's Al how when's Al going home? And my stepmom would say his dad started to cry, so he extended his stay for to two weeks, <laughs> which isn't oh far from the truth. He started every time he thought he started talking about me getting ready to go home, he started getting emotional. Uh-huh. So I said, "Okay, I don't have anything in my calendar, Dad. I'll you know if I can switch my flight around, I will switch to." And I was able to. Unfortunately, the sac my, the sacrifice I made. Was that instead of taking Delta home, I had to take Frontier, which oh is you know, which is essentially going from, um, uh, well, it's like taking a uh, not not a Greyhound, you know, more like right in the back of a box truck <laughs> when it comes to traveling, and it was not the most. It was okay. I had I, you know, I it, I ended up saving nineteen dollars by getting a refund from Delta and then and, and buying a ticket on Frontier one way. But it was a much less a, a much less comfortable trip, specifically because of the lack of leg room, and I have the legs of a six foot five guy. So you know, it wasn't the most fun flight, but it was worth it to hang out with my my parents for a few more extra days. And as I say, sacrifices had to be made, and that was my sacrifice flying Frontier. But other than that, I had a good time. But I'm thrilled to be back up in Michigan because especially we're going up north next week. So. I, 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 I'm just a traveling guy all of a sudden, Greg. So yeah. you're lucky you got me pinned down here this week. So, <laughs> so how's things on your end? Things are well. Uh, we're we're happy to uh, have uh, City Hall join us today on this yes, evening's yes, the program. NBA uh, stats guru. Absolutely. The one and only. He'll be yes. here talking Pistons mainly. We'll touch a little bit about the NBA. He's got some interesting uh, uh, observations about the NBA and about mm-hmm. uh, some, uh, of course, as usual, as usual, from a statistical perspective about what's going on in this in this kind of record setting offensive explosion yeah. of a season that's been going on. And mm-hmm. and it's so it's not just Pistons fans that are noticing it uh, whenever the team with whatever team the Pistons are playing that night. It's uh, throughout 150 the league. 50 points they oh. gave up. To Milwaukee, that game was over in the first quarter. Oh my oh, God, it was oh, bad. for sure, absolutely. Uh, and in two weeks, we hope to have for you uh, our good friend Chris Creighton, a yes. Michigan football coach, of uh, who is riding the crest of a, a wave. Bowl game Atlanta. winner, bowl game winner, nine and four season. Yes. Uh, wonderful year for uh, Chris's kids down in Ypsilanti. We'll hope, hopefully, we'll talk to him in a couple weeks about that, and maybe. Uh, what what it looks like for the future for the for the team and the program and so forth, um, and uh, so that's that's coming up. So stay tuned for that. But uh, anyway, uh, we got lots to do. Uh, City, yeah. we've got uh, pretty much all the teams on on the all the Detroit teams on the docket tonight. But before we get to any of that, we're gonna play a game we like to call "Whose Birthday Is It, Maestro." Everybody knows how we play this game by now. We'll give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports. And if Al can correctly guess that person within the first two clues, he'll uh, get hours of enjoyment with a new ham radio. <laughs> I probably ran across one of those in Florida. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't think about that. You probably yeah. did. 
All okay, right. uh, Al, this person made his name in the world of baseball. He was born on this date in 1964, so he's 59 today. He was, I will, I'm, I'm not going to give it away by telling you that he was a pitcher because that's that's not hardly a giveaway, of course, but he was mm -hmm. a pitcher. Uh, all in the, predominantly in the predominantly in the National League, he uh, was a two-time All Star, uh, and he's also a World Series winner, playing for a team that was at the time in the National League West, mm -hmm. and he recorded eighty-nine saves during his career. Eighty-nine sa uh, save. Oh, okay, because I'm I, I'm dr was dr drifting towards starting pitchers, and then you throw the saves in there just mm -hmm. to throw a monkey wrench into this, mm -hmm. knowing I'm already rusty from not doing this for a month. So you're trying to trip me up here, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> all right, so he's fifty-nine, played mostly in the NL and a West, which would okay. So we're talking the World Series, a World Series, two-time All Star. Time All Star. Oh shit! Oh my God! You know, some of the names that come to mind though don't really fit the timeline, you know. So, mm -hmm. or we're starting pitchers, or right, uh, right, you know, like like I think it's Kent Tacova, but you know he was in the East with the Pirates, or I think a starting pitcher like Bob Welsh or someone like that, or um, hmm, oh God. You know what? I would okay. I, one more clue. I'll give you. Uh, okay. He was the, he was the 1990 NLCS MVP. Oh well, that helps a lot. <laughs> I don't even remember who was in the damn 1990 NLCS. So, uh, you know, it was um, I was, uh, I God. You know what? I'm just gonna have to. I'm just hemming and hawing here. We got a limited time frame, so I'm going to. Pass on a twenty dollar question okay. and wait for the fifty dollar question. So okay. I will stew on that till till after we get past our Detroit Lions topic. Okay. So Sounds you're ready good. to kind of do a post mortem on the season, Greg? Let's dive in. All right, because this might be the last time we'll spend significant amount on the Lions, probably till we get close to the draft. So they ended the season, Greg, on I guess on both a low and high note because they missed the playoffs, but. They, they ended the season with a win over the Packers, and in that win, they knocked the Packers out of the playoffs. So some revenge was there, you know, against the A.A. Ron. So, but yeah, it's, talk about a weird season, Greg. A horrific one and six start. Sheila Ford Hamp actually had to give Motor City Dan Campbell the dreaded vote of confidence. And we were even talking about a little bit at that point. You know, how, what kind of, how much rope do you give this regime? Because things were, Looking, I won't say dire, but there were issues. I and mean, you know they they were in games, but they weren't able to close out games. And there was some uh, some not good clock management and timeout management going on at that point. So there was a lot of questions out there. But he he, he channeled his inner Wayne Fonts and ended the season on an eight and two tear. Uh, the only losses were to uh, a very close loss to Buffalo on Thanksgiving, where they lost on the last play of the game. And then I, the, the the one loss that everybody says that's the that was the one that killed their season when they got dominated in Carolina. That was that even though if you look back, that's the game they needed to win. They didn't, and that could see cost them the playoffs. But they were still in the playoff race, Greg, until the final hours of the final Sunday of the season. And the only they got eliminated by the Seahawks, beating the Rams, helped by some controversial calls. They, I wasn't able to watch it because I was in Florida. Thank goodness I would have probably been losing my shit at the time. As anonymous league sources saying the Lions should be livid was the quote. But despite being limited in the postseason, they still ended the year on a high note by beating the Packers and sending oh, uh, Aaron Rodgers on his way. And uh, now his now the Packers, once again, are going to in an offseason of uh, turmoil because of Rodgers. Meanwhile, the Vikings were proven to be frauds. Mm -hmm. By probably being the worst three, uh, what were they, uh, 13 and th 13 and four, I believe. And they got knocked out in the first round and the Lions beat them. And obviously the Pat now the Bears ended up with the first draft pick in the NFL draft. They're awful. So all of a sudden, Greg, from one and six, they are ending the season, probably considered the favorites to win the division next year. So <laughs> talk about an odd, odd, odd season. Where you know where we were at one point talking about how long is this regime going to last? To 
Dan Campbell's in the running for coach of the year. I mean, it's something else. Uh, for sure. I mean, it was it was quite a turnaround. I got to give them credit. It was a I mean, roller coaster, to say the least. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, but the way it ended, you know, clearly was uh, you, I, you couldn't have, I guess, asked for a, a better ending. A script. Than, it was practically scripted. You know, that eight and two and beating Green Bay on national television at the last on the last game of the season. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you think it was better? That the Lions did. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I not say you want to make the playoffs, mm-hmm. but you think that they're ending the season with a win in Green Bay against Aaron Rodgers was a better way for this season to end than the Lions getting knocked out in the first round of the playoffs, and which would then kind of raise some questions up again about how the, where this team is going. I think in some ways they're not making the playoffs. Well, it might have been for the best when it came to the fan base anyway, because now the fan base is like absolutely giddy about ending the season on a win, on an upswing, and they don't have to stew an entire season on a playoff loss. Well, I would say that, yes, I think it was a little bit better that the season ended the way it did. And I Mm -hmm. also think that that last game Mm -hmm. in Green Bay was kind of a litmus test for the Dan Campbell year now yeah not that they needed that particular game mm-hmm. to cement his legacy because everybody is all about dan campbell right now but mm-hmm. when you consider that the lions sat in the, in the locker room in green bay watched the end of that <clears throat> excuse me that seattle la game and which, which was very questionable call uh, yeah uh, there's no question about that but yeah watch that game end is with essentially seeing their playoff hopes go out the window with that field goal in overtime. And mm-hmm. now you got to turn around and play a game on national TV mm-hmm. where, where it really doesn't matter for your own benefit. If you may, if you win the game, yeah. But the broadcast the fact, was all about Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. A second. But anyway, so but, but what happened was what the team showed, I think everyone, frankly, yeah. that, which was another reason why it was good that it was on national television. Mm-hmm. Forget the announcers is the, yeah how badly the team wanted to knock the Packers out of the playoffs. Yeah, okay. yes. That was, that was their motivation. I mean, yeah. even Dan Campbell said when they interviewed him on the field, mm-hmm. I think it was uh, after the first quarter or half, whatever, right. whenever they yeah. talked to him, mm-hmm. they said, what is, you know, your team's out of it. What's the motivation? He just flat out said, we don't want them to go. Yep. We don't exactly. want them to go. Yeah. And, and so like, why? Because he gets it. He gets the fact that the Lions Packers thing the Lions fan base absolutely despises Aaron mm-hmm. Rodgers and the Packers. And right. why? Because they've they Packers have essentially had their way with the Lions over, over throughout the Aaron Rodgers era. Right. But so the opportunity now to walk into their building uh, on a national televised game where everybody in the world had the Packers winning the game just about yep. was, you know, I remember Howie Long, I think the week before on, on mm-hmm. Fox said, yep. said hey. I just don't, I, or maybe it was Strand, maybe it was uh, Michael Strand. So, you know what? I just don't, he says, I love Dan Campbell. I love what what he's done there. I just don't see him, his team going into Green Bay. Mm-hmm. If Green Bay, he basically painted the picture. He says, if, if the Lions are knocked out of the playoffs before that mm-hmm. game starts, which they were, mm-hmm. and if the Packers have a chance to go to the playoffs by winning, which they did, he yep. says, I don't see the Lions winning that football game. And there, mm-hmm. you really couldn't argue that. I mean, that was a, a, a fairly safe take. Yeah. yeah, okay, I, I, I get it. I, I can mm-hmm. see that. And damn it, they didn't just go out there and just um, fell behind, mm-hmm. scrapped, um, you know, some creative play calling once again, some some daring, some daring do, if, if you will, yep. and came out with a victory and, yeah. and, and ended the game with in victory formation, not having not having to sweat out a, a, a last minute Aaron Rodgers drive. You've seen that a million times. Yeah. Not having to sweat that one out. Getting the interception uh, t- toward the end, of the- Joseph again with or not, it was a Joseph Kirby? No, Kirby Kirby Joseph, right? Yeah, Kirby Joseph picked him off. Uh, He's twice. got his number apparently, yeah. um, and um, you know you, you really couldn't. I, I I think the playoffs at that point, the fan base was clearly disappointed. And yes, you're right, there were some calls in that Rams uh, Seahawks game that were unfortunate. But mm-hmm. I think that despite the the playoff being out of the equation yeah the fans were still let's beat green bay i mean yes. you know let, let's make sure the the, the packers if we can't the, go they ain't going it's right yeah. and that to me al that is almost like it it boils the it boils nfl's this big 
this big conglomerate, okay? It's yes. this big money-making machine, okay? And it boiled that it boiled the end of NFL down and that one single game that night, it boiled the NFL down to back to the mentality of being on the schoolyard on the playground. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not gonna let the big tough bully right. win this game. Mm -hmm. I don't care, I don't care if we're out of the playoffs, I don't care how disappointed we might be that just before we took the field essentially. Our playoff hopes got sh got shit on. I, it, yeah. Who cares? It was it kind of boiled the whole league down to. I guess what it proved to me is there's still there are still opportunities for teams to just go back to their roots of why they play football. Yeah. It's just to beat the other team and to keep the other team from from you know reaching their goal. And I think that's what I think that's good for the game. I mean, mm -hmm. I really do. I really think that the Lions winning that game was good for the NFL in addition mm -hmm. to being good for them, because that showed that, yeah, there still is for, for anybody who wants to say that the NFL teams are, will kind of take it easy if they're, if they're eliminated. No, this showed yeah. that there's still that pride yeah. and there's still that, that mentality that says, uh, damn it. I don't care where I, and I mm -hmm. don't care that we're in your building on G in January where it's 20 degrees outside. I don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, you're not going to the playoffs period. I don't yep. care about the Aaron Rodgers, the romance of Aaron Rodgers. I don't care <laughs> yeah, about yeah, Chris Collins, the, the Chris no. Collinsworth, uh, Aaron Rodgers romance. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, yeah. and I think that's I think that's what that game showed, mm -hmm. and and that's why I think I agree with you that I think that it was almost better that way. Yeah. That um, the Lions, with nothing to play for in quotation marks, right. did what they did. Yeah, and they and they finished ahead of Green. That was the other thing. Yeah, they had an opportunity to finish ahead of Green Bay in the standings. Yeah, 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 yeah. At, at nine and eight, who saw nine and eight coming after no. a one and six start? Right, right. And what I what one of the things I took from that game was Dan Campbell learned his lesson because the ending of that game was very similar to the first Minnesota game, right? Where he where he decided in the Minnesota game it was what a a field if he kicked if he went for the field goal it would have been a seven point lead. It still would have made it a. It still would have been a, a touchdown game, and and he elected to kick the field goal. They missed, and then they gave him good field position, and Minnesota beat him in the last seconds. In this game, it was a similar situation. They're a little, obviously closer to the goal line, but again, there was about a minute left. It was what I think fourth. In, well, actually, was even better. It was what uh, it was second in twenty, at first, and then uh, uh, Ben Johnson pulled a hook in the ladder. Yeah, <laughs> I I literally whooped when I saw that, and they got 12 yards. You know, put them in four down territory, and on fourth and short, instead of kicking the field goal to make it a one score game, the keep it a it would still have been a one score game. It would have been a seven point lead, and but it still would have meant Aaron Rodgers would have had about what 50 seconds or so to try and drive him down. And we've how many times have we seen that happen? Right, you no, know, over the years. Instead. <laughs> Campbell decided, I'm not going to kick the field goal this time. I'm going to go for the dagger. And he put the ball in Jared Goff's hands, and he hit DJ Chark on a four-yard pass, first down, game over. And if he had done that in the Minnesota game and they were able to convert, they might be in the playoffs now. Or, you know, and might have been able to do some damage the way they were playing at the end of the year. So I think that game, in a lot of ways, showed the growth of Dan Campbell as well. Because he, I think during the season he was getting – He's kept the aggressiveness, but he was starting to get a little bit smarter in his decision making. He's still not perfect yet, and most NFL coaches, you know, need to play Madden and learn how to use the clock a little better. But in that game, I think that really brought out his growth as a coach and also the growth of the Lions culture and, and your, how you're driving home the. It doesn't matter if we're out of the playoffs. It's about winning the game and about beating the Packers and and spoiling their season, which is actually what happened. Because and there's something, especially during the pregame shows, all the all the analysts picked the Packers. All the analysts were talking about what kind of damage Aaron Rodgers could do in the playoffs. No one would want to play the Packers. They kept talking about no one would want to play the Packers. I think they had won four straight games at that point. And I'm thinking, wait a second, the Lions are even hotter. And if they make the playoffs, no one was going to want to play the Lions at that point. So I think that made it even all the more um, pleasurable, I guess, the way, the way to put it, in that win, just to see the comeuppance of the pundits and the talking heads 
about how no one thought the Lions were going to be able to step up their game in a game that meant nothing to them playoffs wise. And yet, you know, cut, and, and, and on our national TV, especially. And, uh, you know, this, I, it, this is what it, it really felt like one of those Detroit versus everybody things, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what? Uh, wasn't there also a play where, where Campbell declined a penalty? Yes. In that, yes. That, that was kind of, uh, that was kind of, uh, wise as yeah well. because essentially he wasn't worried about the yardage he mm-hmm. wanted to keep the time time it, yeah it was about <laughs> running the clock and right. having more plays mm-hmm. rather than the yardage so he was mm-hmm. very i'll be better off with what uh what uh instead of first and 10 but the clock having that moved I'll just decline the penalty and take second and five, but the clock had moved 15 seconds or something like that. Right, right. And that, um, and that was a, that's the sort of thing you would expect from like Mike Vrabel or, um, or, or uh, Bill Belichick, mm-hmm. and Dan Campbell's pulling these moves out. Yeah, so that was a very smart. Uh, and there were a couple of times late in the season too where the, the fan base of the other team, I noticed on yeah. Twitter, was saying things like, "We got out coached by Dan Campbell." Our yeah. coach, uh, our coach was out coached by Dan Campbell. I know that that was the, the that Jets was the game would be one of those. The, the, right. It's, yeah. it's exactly what I'm thinking about the yeah. Jets game. But no, I mean, hey, you know, I, I obviously uh, had my issues with, with Campbell. I, but I, you know, what am I going to say? I mean, I, yeah. I, it's hard for me to sit here. And I know you could, still, you were on the meathead train for a very right. long time. I mean, it's hard for me to sit here and, and continue to, 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 uh, bash the guy when, yeah. when they, when they, when they ended the season on such, on such a high note. Now, what is going to be interesting, though, yeah. is to see how they handle yeah. this modicum of su- success. Now, yeah, this, about is, this, this is a franchise that has a history of not doing that very well. We talked about we we talked about this after they laid that egg in Carolina. In Carolina. Okay, yeah. we said, well, geez, you know, they started to read all these press clippings. They were yeah. the darlings of the NFL, and they had a chance to win, not just win that game, but be, control their playoff destiny and yep. so forth. And they fell flat on their face. So that yeah. was an indication that they still had some some ways to go in terms of right. shedding that same old Lions label. Okay. Now, mm-hmm. you mentioned a few minutes ago that despite the fact that the, the – and you're right, the Vikings finished 13-4, and four, but they, they did it with smoke and mirrors. Right. But you, when you think about – when you think about it, at the end of the year, the better team in the division was the Lions. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, had they played a third time, I wouldn't have been surprised if the Lions would have won. Now, here's the other thing. The Lions mm-hmm. were 5-1 and one in the division. Yeah. 5-1. and one. Yeah. And the only loss was that early game you mentioned uh, toward the beginning of the year in Minnesota, which was – Which they – which was, as I said – It was theirs to lose. Yeah, theirs yeah, to win. Yeah, it was theirs to, to lose. Exactly. Exactly. And so – um, you can make the case that they were the better team by the end of the year, even though there was a four win gap uh, between the two teams. You can make the case that the, the, the tougher team to the, the, the teams that the team that they would not have they would have rather have played the Vikings than the Lions. What I'm trying to get, yeah, exactly. Any yeah. team that was in the playoffs. Well, you could make the lot- argument by the end of the year, the only teams in the end of the sea playing better were the Niners and the Eagles. You, yeah, you could really go one step further and say there are a lot of t- playoff teams that were probably glad the Lions got knocked out. Frankly. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that I don't think would have wanted to play them. Now, not that mm-hmm. they were scared of the Lions necessarily, right. but they, they presented a challenge. Yeah, that, if, that, if, that, if given a choice, I think the, it, every time they would have picked the Vikings over I, the Lions. Well, not yeah. only that, but I, you can't tell me that the 49ers, that the Lions would not have given the 49ers a better game than the Seahawks did. Oh, yeah, definitely. That would have been the seeding. If the Lions made the playoffs, they yep. would have gone to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Not saying they would have won, yep. but I think they would have given a better showing than the, than the Seahawks did. Okay. Yep. So now here we are. Offseason comes, mm-hmm. draft comes, and so forth. Lions have four picks in the top 55, Okay, that's which is incredible. And now you go into the offseason with, and I can see it happening a mile away. They are going to be... You thought that the you thought that the um, hard knocks thing was a big deal. Yeah. Every every football magazine you pick up in August next year, July and August, every one of them just about mm-hmm. is going to pick the Lions to win the division. Just yeah. about every and I and I get it. I understand that. And they, I, they I, are going to be the hip like Super Bowl right. thing right now. Right. right. It, they're the kind of team that SI would put on the cover yeah. as being. You're right. Yeah. It's the Lions this year, you know. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what they're going to be up against now is, you know, it's one thing to be the, yeah, it's, it's one thing to be 
the cute little lions with the hard knocks in August yeah. and okay, nobody's expecting anything. Now, when you're next training camp, mm -hmm. now all eyes, the media coverage is going to get more intense. There's going to mm -hmm. be more out of town writers, I think, in in, in training yeah. camp in, in mm -hmm. Allen Park than it than has ever been. There's going to, I mentioned all the preseason uh, magazines are yeah. all going to pick the line. The teams oh. will not overlook them, seeing them as an automatic it's, W. It's on, almost you know, right, and it's almost going to it's almost going to be you, like you're that you're derelict if you don't if you don't pick the Lions to win the division. It's like well, yeah. who else are you going to pick? Yeah. Are you going to pick the Packers? Are you going to mm -hmm. pick the, the Vikings with their horrible defense? They fired their defensive coordinator by the Oh my the God, their defense, defense was awful. My you're not going to pick the. They're not going to pick the Bears. No. Nope. Well, who else are you going to pick? Yeah. You almost you almost have to pick the Lions. You're almost derelict if you don't pick the mm -hmm. Lions to yep. win the division. So now, how will they handle that? That's that's the next. It's one thing. The eight and two. It's one thing to go from it one and six to nine and eight. That's great. Mm -hmm. But now, how do you go into a, a season now? Essentially. It's funny. I mean, the season's just over with, and they're already favorites to win the division. Yeah. And you're talking about a team. They finished four games behind the first place team, and that first place team yeah. is going to be dismissed. Yeah. Totally dismissed. So I think that that's, that's the next challenge. It isn't so much what's going to take place on the field. It's what's going to take place between the, between the ears of these mm -hmm. players now. Yeah. Because as we've seen, as we've seen, you know, this whole same old Lions thing, Al, isn't mm -hmm. just limited to – wins and losses on the field. It's mm -hmm. not just limited to what happens on Sundays. Right. The same old Lions thing is an, is a broad, is a big tent. Okay. It's a big tent. Mm -hmm. And part of that tent is the mental, is their mental ability to handle things. Mm -hmm. And what they've been very bad at is part of the same old Lions thing yeah. is their inability to, tr to handle any sort of success whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Any sort of expectations whatsoever. That's what we saw in Carolina. So mm -hmm. I'm hesitant to say, to, to, I'm just wondering now what's yeah. going to happen when they walk into training camp in July next year and everyone in the free world is picking them to win the division. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know when the last time that was that they, that they, everybody would have picked them maybe mm -hmm. sometime in the early nineties. Yeah. That's, that's probably would have but to be the last time. I, I, I don't know. Maybe after, mm -hmm. I guess after 91, when they went 12 and four, but right. I, 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 you know, I don't even think that was as much of a, sh of a shoe in as this one is, right. this is a no brainer to pick the line. You can't, right. you, like I say, you'd be derelict, you'd be stupid mm -hmm. not to pick them. <laughs> so I, 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 I just don't know how they're going to handle that, that kind of um, expectation. Yeah. And, they, and especially when you factor in, they have two first round draft picks. They got five in the first three rounds. I think five in the first eighty or something like that. So all of a sudden, that, that's like five. That should be five starters right there. Right. Right. Depending on if they pick a quarterback or not, which right, is no right. other discussion. Right. Uh, they're well under the salary cap right now. I think eighteen million, uh, and they could clear it a significant amount more if they move on from like Batai, Brockers, Harris, Cup, all the guys. No, and all those guys are. Like Batai barely has barely played in two years because of injuries, and they, you know, so they've been, they've been able to the guys they would cut aren't um, core pieces. You know, they're older veterans who from the previous regime for the most part. Yeah. So Jared Goff is playing the, was playing the best football of his career this year, and he's under contract for two more years at a market rate of thirty million dollars a year. You know, he is not underpaid or overpaid. He is paid what he should be. So, so the quarterback position, if you want it to be, is fine right now. I would, you know, golf isn't a, a golf isn't elite, but he's good, you know, and you can win with good if you have the pieces around him. He proved that in L.A. Uh, what was really something, though, Greg, as soon as the season ended, you had free agents. Uh, they're, they're, uh, you had free agents like Williams, Kaminsky, Bugs, uh, all act, literally campaigning to come back saying, I want to come back to this team. Uh, especially with uh, Kaminsky, literally put it on his Instagram, sign me. I want to <laughs> come back. And, and, and a few other players have done that. And that, what's the last time you ever seen any team have that? Where you have uh, internal free agents, not just keep, you know, not just saying to their coaches, I'd like to come back. They're going to the fan base and saying, tell, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell the team, we want to come back. I, I can't believe we're talking about the Lions and having players. Consider what three, four, three, four years ago, you had uh, a regime that was literally kicking guys out who weren't fitting their mold, and now 
you got guys who are begging to stay. And that's that's almost for a lifelong Lions fan, that is mind-boggling to me to see the kind of uh, loyalty that this regime has generated in players. Well, it does speak very well of Campbell and mm-hmm. his coaches, and um, you know, winning will do that. Of course, I mean yeah. that's that's that helps. Oh yeah, but, oh, of course. that you, is definitely you, but, played into it as well. Exactly. But you, but you still saw some of that. As much as mm-hmm. I bash the team, you still saw a little bit of that, even coming off of three thirteen and one. Yeah, where you had a lot of folks on that team that 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 were holding the you know, staying the course. You know, no, yeah, we're, and we're, we talked we're, about this. Is that they concentrated on signing their own free agents. They didn't make any big outside guys. Well, yes, and we were a little bit, also a little bit critical of that too. Because we were. Lot, because I would they brought, that, yes. Essentially, uh, uh, Brad Holmes. DJ Chark back, was about the biggest name they signed. Right, and Brad Holmes yeah. brought essentially brought back the same defense that was yeah. not very good in 2021, exactly. and so we were like, hmm. Mm-hmm. And the way they started 2022, it's like yeah. the first <laughs> six, seven games of that season is like mm-hmm. giving them 30 points a game. The defense got better for sure as the season went on. Campbell got better, I think, himself mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a game manager. Uh, Aaron Glenn, I think, survived, uh, uh, you know, got through his little um, – yeah. uh, he weathered the storm. Yeah. Uh, ben Johnson, of course, just got more and more popular as the year wore on. And that's all fine and dandy. That's great. Mm-hmm. I, but, again, that's over with. Now, yeah. now, now 2023. And, and mm-hmm. so what happens in 2023 now? Yeah. This, to me, to me, and this goes along with what you've said, too, about year right. three, your whole thing about year three. Okay. Right. Well, to me, the truth, the, the, the real big test here is how they handle 2023. If they yeah. come out in 2023 and take care of business and win the division as they should mm-hmm. and inject these, like you, you mentioned, these win these a picks. playoff game. Right. Please, in, in, well, right. Remember this. They haven't won the division since what? 91? Well, not only win a 95? playoff game, but get a home playoff game. That's the first thing. Get a home right. playoff game. Number yeah. one, win it. But the thing is, is that, is that, if they do that, if they come out and take care of business and, and act like the best team in the division that I think that they are, and I can't even believe I'm saying that. Yeah. Well, then they should. That to me is then they that is the true test. Then they yeah. have passed that test with flying colors. If they stumble and monkey around and finish around with the same record or worse next year, that's going to be a huge, huge disappointment. Yeah. For oh, yeah. everyone, everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what I mean about the the. You know, but but I think Campbell, what he does do well though, mm-hmm. is he has this way of getting his players to just kind of keep, keep their heads down, the, puts the blinders on, and just yeah. focus on the 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 mission at hand, and they, they block out all that noise. Yeah, and so, but again, this will be the test mm-hmm. because there's no no self respecting pundit of the NFL is going to pick anybody but the Lions to win that division. Mm-hmm. I, I, guarantee, I, I can guarantee you. Yeah. So they're going to go in without question as being the, the, the by far, mm-hmm. the, the favorites to win that division. Yeah. And and by winning the division, I don't mean winning it with a 9-8 and eight record either. Winning it, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to be expected to win yeah. double digits, 10, yeah. 11, 12 games for sure. Right. I mean, yeah. that's just period. So... Now it has a lot, a lot to do with it. Still has a lot to do with, with if they make improvements on defense. But like you said, they've got all those draft picks, so that mm-hmm. we, we we presume there'll be at least a couple of starters that they'll be able to plug in there. Right. They are very. The, the thing that is exciting about the team is that a lot of their a lot of their best players on both sides of the football are young. Yeah, and that includes the defense. So mm-hmm. they've got even their the few good players they've got on defense are all young. They've got a lot of good young players on offense. Mm-hmm. Their offensive line is, is, is not young in the strictest sense, except for Sewell. Yeah. But they are young in the sense that they're, they're in their prime. They're, they're reaching their prime. They have, you know, the Ragnows of the world and Decker and, and, um, and uh, Jackson and these guys, they're all, they're none of mm-hmm. them are old. I mean, they don't have any guys that are 30 on that offensive line. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sewell, who to, I believe is going to be a Hall of Famer. That's how that's how good I think this kid mm-hmm. is. Is a beast. It's 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 a it's a crock that he's not on the Pro Bowl. Right. But he, he is a to me he's going to be on All Pro right tackle for yeah. years. Well, Amon Ross St. Brown is tracking to be 
numbers, at least catch wise, the greatest wide receiver in Lions history already. He's right. got like 200 catches in two years. Right. I mean, Megatron now, didn't do that. He, well, he only averaged like 10 yards a catch. Yeah, but, but I mean, still, still, but I mean, he's a, yeah, but he's a different type of receiver. Right. But catch wise and usage wise, uh, it's been. I can't remember the last time the Lions had that young of a wide receiver literally break out the way he has. Well, you know, I mean, it took Herman Moore like two years to become who he was. Megatron was a Megatron until about two years into his career. Yeah, well, you know, there's... And Amon Ra is putting up numbers that no, very few men have done. Well, it's a different era. I mean, you know, Herman Moore yeah. came in. The NFL wasn't his past. Oh, you remember he was now, also and, blind and they got him contacts. Well, <laughs> they, his, yeah, his, his, his yeah. vision, right. That's right. And also Barry Sanders. You had Barry Sanders. Yeah. So the emphasis was on the running game at that point. Mm-hmm. But every quarterback wants to have the real, uh, the, 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 the really successful quarterbacks always yeah. have that guy mm-hmm. that they, if they need a completion, if they need uh, that they're, the Mr. Reliable guy, the guy that they yeah, that like who was always that guy up. for Tom Brady in uh, in uh, New oh, England. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah, I can't remember his name either, but I can picture him. <laughs> but Wes I know Welker? exactly which. What's that? Wes Welker. That's he was the first one, okay. and then he, then he was replaced by, God damn it, nine. I, I'll have to look it up, I think. Okay. But yeah, okay. for, it was Welsh Welker. And then when Welker retired, uh, God, I'll have to look it up. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, they all they, they all have their that, that guy that that bails them out. And it, and I'm not talking, It's and it's really kind of, it's selling it's selling it short to call them a possession receiver. I, yeah. I'm not, I don't mean that necessarily. Right. A guy that w- whenever they're in trouble, they need a completion, that they know that they, if they find this guy, He's going to catch the football, no matter. Julian what. Elderman, by the way. Elderman, yes. Yes. And so that's what St. Brown is. You know, yeah. he's, he he brings more value than just looking at. I, I was yeah. deriding his yards per. Well, catch. he yeah, he's one of the reasons why they didn't need T.J. Hawkinson. Right. Yeah. They got product. They got production uh, tied in by committee, uh, as it turned out. Nine, Mitchell, t- nine, nine touchdowns from those three right, essentially right, role players. Something Zilstra and, and Mitchell, right. Yeah. And uh, so maybe is that sustainable? I don't know, but they have, and, but the NFL is not, we talked about this last time. NFL mm-hmm. is not a tight ends league. It's a, it's a wide receiver league. Yeah. You have to have uh, wide receivers are all the rage right now, but let's, yep. let's face it. I mean, yep. you mentioned Herman Moore. Yeah. He came in the league in the early nineties at a time where it was still, there's still a running, the running back league running, right. Yeah. The running backs were still, you know, you had Emmett Smith, Emmett Thomas, Barry Sanders, you know, they had a bunch they, of guys. Yeah, you were still seeing high first round picks on running backs, which right. you never still had a lot of thousand yard rushers in the whole nine right. yards and the running yeah. backs were still considered and they were all in the league for eight, nine, 10 years. Okay. Yeah. Well now, you know, wide, I mean, running backs are, are short shelf guys and you get maybe mm. two or three good years of production and then they go away. Yeah. But receivers though, um, it's, it, it's, it, it's just, a, the emphasis now is on that, mm-hmm. you know, on that, that big play guy who can go yeah. run like the wind and, yeah. and so forth. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a different, it's a different league right now for sure. Well, let me ask you this, since we were kind of talking about running backs, the, uh, Jamal Williams, 28 years old. Yeah. He's a, he's a free agent now. Right. He's a fan favorite. He has right. had a career year, hundred, a thousand yards, 17 touchdowns. But he's also a 28-year-old running back going to get his third contract. And we know right. how running backs age. Right. But he's also a team leader. He's uh, essentially become in a lot of – he was the face of the team on hard knocks. The yeah. fan base – actually, the Packers fan base as well loves him. Yeah. I mean, as you said, Lions and Packers fans hate each other. Right. But they both agree. We love Jamal Williams. Do you sign Jamal Williams? Because he's you know he's going to want to raise. Well, and this is, all, some, this is something that the team is fans and the team got to figure out is that you can't yeah. keep everybody. Right. Yeah. yeah well, but first, do you keep first of all, well, first of all, I, I would mm-hmm. correct you. I, the, the, the Lions fans hate the Packers fans, but I don't think it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's the other right. Way. But right. I will say this about back to Williams. Mm-hmm. It, it, this is where at, at the NFL, well, not just the NFL, Pro sports is a business, and that's a, yeah. and it's a hackneyed term. It's it's mm-hmm. cliche, but it's true because now you have to take all. You you mentioned a lot of 
uh, the intangibles. Fans. You mentioned a fan yeah. favorite. You mentioned he's a gr- a great guy. Everybody loves him. He's a yeah. he's a character. He's yeah. and he was productive. Okay, it wasn't yeah. like he was just some clown who's. You yeah, know, he, I mean, was, he was productive. he was the number one running back by the end of the year. Right. So. Yeah. But the bottom line is, he is what. what bottom line is what you mentioned. He's twenty eight. Yeah. He's going into his third contract. He's probably gonna. This is it for him. I mean, this yeah. is where he's gonna make. His he most wants money, to get basically. paid. Yeah. Right. And this whole notion of will he give the Lions a, a hometown discount? There's no hometown discounts in football. Thank you. Uh, there's, yes. there's just, there just isn't. I and think Bean he, agrees with you. I can hear him. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You, I mean, these guys are trying to, are you know, they're. He's probably going to be in the league. Yeah. At max, another three years. Yeah. Let's face it. And after that, it's probably not going to. He's probably not going to be in the league anymore. If he is, right. he'll just be hanging on. Right. He's never going to get the kind of touches and be the kind of player in three years that he is now. Right. So, what do the Lions do? How many is all going to be about term? How many years do you give this guy? Um, does he want to come back to Detroit? I'm sure, I'm sure he does. Oh yeah, he's, sure he's, he he's he's on record saying he wants to come back. But I but you, you I completely agree with you. He's not going to cut you much of a deal if any kind of deal at all because as you said he wants to get paid this will be his last chance at a decent contract but you know here's the thing though too al is that Mm -hmm. guys don't the guys just don't get plugged into different teams and different schemes right and automatically carry that production over Mm -hmm. um just because they're they had a great year now they're gonna go let's let's say he signs with the bears i'm just making that yeah and it doesn't mean that he's going to be as good with the Bears as he was because there's a lot of factors there. Yeah. The, off, the Lions have a great offense. He may now where, where there may be a, a hometown discount, for lack of a better term. Where, what he may mm-hmm. end up doing is he what may end up happening is he may look at the the offensive line that the Lions have. Mm-hmm. Now, even though at times they did struggle to run the football, but for mm-hmm. the most part, these he, I don't know he's going to you can look around the NFL, look around yeah. the league. It's a top ten line, a, right? Uh, well, yeah. I would say maybe even higher than Tom. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Five, I, yeah. I don't know that he would look around the league to the teams that would offer him money and see the kind of blockers that he has in Detroit. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. what does that mean in terms of money? In terms of how much money he'd be willing to? Yeah. Is what kind of wiggle room that gives the Lions? I don't know. Uh, my gut tells me mm-hmm. that the, the two sides will come to an arrangement agreement yeah. and that he will be back. I don't. I just have that feeling. I don't mm-hmm. know why. I just feel like that they'll they'll make it work out somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. Now I know there's been times where team players will, the big the superstar guys, yeah, will take pay cuts in mm-hmm. order to free up some money to sign somebody else. I know Stafford did it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm not it's sure. Infamously, Tom Brady was the was yeah. the was the big yeah. name. Yeah, that. you know, you that happens sometimes. I'm not expecting it to happen, but I think that they're. And I'm not expecting it to happen necessarily for Jamal Williams, but. You know, I think that they'll come to an, uh, an agreement somehow. I'm not sure yeah. how they'll do it, right? But I think that uh, now, would they franchise tag him? I don't know. That's another. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that on the table, by the way, for him? Tell you the truth, I don't know. Okay. But okay. I, but that's the other thing, though. Players do not like to get. Franchised. No, I know they don't like that. I know they, they hate don't. being franchised. So, I know. I know. I know. You know so, but yeah, I think this is something <laughs> that the fan base. This is uncharted territory for the Lions fan base, where. Right. They're going to want to keep everybody, you know, because it's such right. a, you know, it's so, it's such a good feeling. How Let's bring the band ended, back. Let's but you can't back. bring everybody back. Right. right. Or, you know, because you have, you know, you have to move forward. And the NFL, usually you're churning at least one quarter of your roster almost every year. So it's, uh, I agree with you. I think they will bring him back. If they, but it's going to be, I think it will say volumes if they decide to draft a running back in the draft or not. I mean, there are some talk. Uh, there's a lot of talk that the Lions might be interested in taking the Texas running back in the first round, with the, like the 18th pick. So, it's, there's there's still a lot of unanswered questions here when it comes to free agency, when it comes to what to do a quarterback. Because the if 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 the season goes next year as the common wisdom thinks it will, where this team, the floor of this team, is home playoff game. And probably, hopefully, winning a home playoff game, winning the division. They'll, they'll never, they won't draft this high again anytime soon. Do you, you know, you still have a good, you have a good quarterback. He's under contract for two more years. Do the line, you know, if someone's there for them at six or eighteen, do you take them and sit them and pull the uh, 
you know, you pull the Aaron Rodgers and just have him sit for a couple years. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that I think there's there's a lot of questions that that won't be answered for a few months for how this team how this team believes they're going to be built. Because I think it was very telling during his season a press conference when Brad Holmes said. When asked about golf, he said it's a lot easier to get worse at quarterback oh, than yeah. to get better. Yeah, and that would that would probably be the scenario. They're not going to move on from golf. I think that's pretty obvious at this point. It's just a matter of how much draft capital. Because I think we're both in agreement they need to draft the quarterback. It's a matter of do you take one day one, day two, or day three, and and that would mean if you take one on day one. That's a guy who's going to start for you in a couple years. Day two or day three, that's a guy that may ultimately be groomed to be your backup. So, on, you know, might be a guy. So there's a lot of roster building to be done yet here. When you think about it, there's a lot of unanswered questions. We don't know. As Brad Holmes said, I think there was an interview with him and Dan Campbell, that year three was a year that they thought it was all going to start to come together. And so they were a little bit ahead of schedule right now. So it's just, there, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. I don't think anybody expected the team to be ultimately as good as it is. So yeah, are some of these guys, play, uh, are some of these guys one year wonders? Are some of these guys only are at their peak and going to start to decline? There's a lot of answers here, that, a lot of questions here, and I don't think we know the answers to yet. Right. <laughs> um, but what I think is a good thing is that the mm-hmm. the, the urgency to yeah. draft a quarterback has yeah. been pulled way back. Right. I th- okay. There's not. You don't not, have to reach for a guy. Right. You yeah. don't. Right, exactly. And um, I think the lines are still okay if they mm-hmm. don't even draft a quarterback. Yeah. As much as and it's funny for me to say that because I've been. Same for years they yeah. should, yeah. But I think, well, we now, but, but I was saying that they want them to drop well, I would, them. right. I was saying that because Matthew Stafford was getting older. Now yep. Goff is still not is still in the younger. He's on the right side of thirty, right? Yep. So I that changes the dynamic, of course, mm-hmm. and 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 the way he played in twenty twenty two certainly is mm-hmm. cause for uh, optimism. Um, there's nothing that says to me that he's going to just drop off the, the cliff in terms of right. his production. I mean, I don't, again, he's got a great offensive line. He, his decision-making is to me is really improved. Mm-hmm. Um, he's seems to have, it seems to kind of almost, it's, he's slowly making this his team now. I mean, I think yeah. that the, the players really believe in him and this is kind of becoming his team. Now, that's a good you know? point. And, and I think that that's something that, um, you know, that is, makes this whole quarterback conundrum not right. as much of a conundrum as it was last year. Yeah. So everybody looked at golf when they made the trade two years ago. I can't mm-hmm. remember two years, but when they when they made the trade two years ago, everybody said, well, okay, um we'll just this is a stopgap guy. We'll we'll write it out with him for a couple of years and then we'll start to look for a quarterback. And this this whole golf thing will be nothing more than a blip on the screen and he'll just be a the the, the transitional quarterback until we find the next Start. Right. Yeah. Well, now I, you'd be kind of foolish to to, to still be talking like that. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know why you would. I mean, look at yeah. the guy's numbers. Um, yeah. Okay. They started out one and six, but you look at the guys, the way he finished. And yeah. um, I just, the thing I liked about it is that, that mm-hmm. even when he wasn't at his best, the Lions were winning football games. Yeah. There were a couple, yeah. couple games there where he wasn't great. He wasn't mm-hmm. great. But they still were able to, to figure out a way to win. Why? Because he wasn't turning the ball over. Mm-hmm. That's the key, Al. Yeah. If you can, you mentioned, oh, you know, he's not great, but he's not elite, but maybe if he's good, you can win with good. You can win with good if your good guy doesn't turn the ball over. And he and did. That's what, he's, he's and, right. I mean, completely uh, turning the ball over. Right. I mean, yeah. he had that. He had that one fumble in when he fumbled the snap in Carolina. Okay. Right. Other than that, no mm-hmm. interceptions. Yep. Tons of touchdowns. Yep. Um. The, the the misses that he had were misses where nobody could catch them. It wasn't right. like they were they were like near near interceptions. They just were throws that nobody was going to catch. Mm-hmm. So you give me a guy that doesn't throw. Give me a guy that throws five or six picks a year. I'll take that. Yeah, he doesn't have to. He yeah. doesn't have to have a four thousand yards, twenty nine yeah. touchdowns I mean, this year. You I, know? Mean, and I, I think he ended up with like eight picks this year. Yeah. yeah. And how many? And how many in that eight and two stretch? 
Oh, I don't think he had any. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah, not it's sustainable. Really, it's really starting to look like the problem wasn't golf. It was the problem was McVeigh. <laughs> it really no, does. The, well, the problem, the the thing is too, though. This is such NFL is such a uh, mercurial league. You can, uh, we, we're saying all these things. Yeah. And then you have two or three bad weeks coming out of the game next <laughs> yeah, year. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and you're right back. To, you're right back to where you thought yeah, you yeah. were. The uh, narrative has ago. shifted all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah, it's. Uh, but isn't it nice to talk about the lines in a good way after? Uh, well, what, yeah, what, of course. How many years have we been uh, cursing? Of course. The lines? <laughs> of course. Yeah. All right. Uh, we need to get moving on the show, so yeah. we got a couple more talks, yeah. to talk, a couple more things to get through before we wrap it up. So, question two of the birthday again. Okay, born on this date in 1964, he was a reliever. Obviously, he uh, won a World Series in 1990. He was the NLCS MVP in 1990, as a matter of fact, uh, and he was a two-time All Star, saved 89 games, and was known for being a hothead. Oh. Oh shoot. Ah. <sighs> Known for being a hothead. There again, there's names that can throw out there, but they don't really fit the timeline. At least that, that I can remember. Oh, I'm just I don't know, and we're kind of short on time anyway. So okay. I'm gonna pass again and we'll see what see if see if I can figure it out in the gimme. But okay. at least now I don't have to worry about getting my ham license. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little Red Wings. The I guess the hot topic here in Detroit over the past couple weeks is Dylan Larkin seems to be in a contract impasse with the team. Uh, the trade deadline is approximately five to six weeks away. It's early March. Larkin is going to be an unrestricted free agent. And usually if, you, if you're going to trade him, that you know it's got to be done at the trade deadline if you don't want to lose him for nothing, if you're not going to resign him. And there's a lot of rumors and innuendo out there that contract talks are in an impasse. And the thing is, Eiserman's GM, uh, Steve Eiserman has a history of moving on from veterans if contract talks reach an impasse or they don't fit the timeline or they don't really fit how he sees the team's going to be built. The um, the most famous name being Martin St. Rui, who was literally a fan favorite, I believe a captain in Tampa, and Eisman just let him walk. And he mm -hmm. proved to be right, but mm -hmm. that means Eisman's not afraid of making the hard decisions. He's done it with uh, Vincent Le Cavalier and uh, uh, Jonathan Durer and a few other guys. Reports are that they have agreed on term, Greg, but remain apart on the average annual value. Mm -hmm. Larkin wants nine million. The Wings are offering eight. What do you think is going to happen here? Because obviously, Larkin, born and raised in Michigan, played mm -hmm. for the University of Michigan, was drafted by the local team, mm -hmm. is the face of the franchise for the most part. He's the team captain, mm -hmm. and he is. I think you could argue at at least right now he may not ultimately be their best player, but over the past few years he has been their best player. I mean, he he doesn't have the ceiling of say a uh, uh, of a Cider or a Raymond or a few other guys, but and that's the other thing is Larkin. The Larkin we see right now is probably as good as he's going to get. So, do you think there's a chance that Wings just decide to think he's just going to be too rich for, for for he's not worth the money he's going to get paid for the production he's ultimately going to give us, and there's also the fact that. He doesn't really match a rebuild timeline. Where do you think they're going here? Um, all great questions. He's going to be 27 in July, which I can't believe. So yeah. what's going to happen is you, you give him an eight-year contract. Well, you mentioned, by the way, you said that the, the, the two sides agree on term, which I believe is eight years. Eight years, exactly. Okay, so he signs for eight years. He'll be 35 when that contract is over. Okay, fine. But one of the things you said, though, that really resonated with me was when you said, is this it in terms of, mm -hmm. of his ceiling now yeah. now that which is not a bad ceiling it's not no no uh, hey, it's essentially you know, 20, uh, uh 25 a, to 30 goals uh that's essentially a a second line center on a very you know, on a good on a great team right i mean yeah. he 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 seems to be a good leader for the most part i like him as a captain i think i like mm -hmm. how he handles the press the media i yeah. you know i have no qualms about he's done that, nothing but, wrong yeah right right yeah. and so so that's fine and dandy um, the, the, I, I'm frankly, I'm surprised that they, they, they both have agreed on eight years. I, I yeah. I'm a little surprised that I usually it's not the usually it's not the hit per year. Yeah, and that's according the, to Anzer Khan out of MLI. Yeah, it's usually it's the term that the two sides can't get 
right. come to uh, but uh, agreement on. But apparently they, they have both agreed that they, for whatever reason they picked eight years as the term. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, okay, now you say, well, it, it seems kind of silly. If they're only $1 million apart, why couldn't each side kind of budge a little bit? We do, right. maybe we do eight and a half or we yeah. do, you know, something like that. I, again, same with Jamal, same with Jamal Williams. I get the mm -hmm. gut feeling that they'll get this done. Now, yeah. I, you know, I, mean, I know you're saying about about Eiserman with his history, mm -hmm. but those that was a history with another franchise. Okay? Yeah. Now you're talking about the Red Wings. He was the captain, of course. Eiserman was. He essentially named Larkin the. He did name Larkin the captain. I mean, right. There's there's a certain. I, it's one thing to walk away from a Martin St. Louis. It's mm -hmm. one thing to work walk away from a Druid. It's one thing to walk away from a Lecavier, but it's a different deal. Mm -hmm. To walk away from a kid who's local, who's born in Waterford, went to U of M, mm -hmm. yep. played the Red Wings all of his career, made the mm -hmm. team as a as a teenager, which is only few people have done, and one, and Eisenman yep. was one of them, and a three time All Star, right, and yep. uh, captain. So mm -hmm. I, all these things tell me that I don't think they're going to let one million dollars a year stand between them and getting this thing done. There's going to yep. be I I wouldn't be surprised at all if. Next week they announce. Yeah. Oh, guess what? Uh, eight years, eight point five or eight point three five, or maybe there's incentives in there. I don't know, but I, I don't. I just don't <laughs> see it mm -hmm. coming. I will say this: point. if, if I kind of fall on your that they, they'll, they'll they'll come to agreement on something. I think the guy I think is more likely to go is Bertuzzi. I you know because well, he won't make as much. Yeah, but, but I you know yeah. he just you no know, he's up he's you know a top six forward. When he's but healthy, he's never healthy. He's never healthy. He's a bit never of a knucklehead, healthy. as we know. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we know with the with the anti-vax stuff. Yeah. He was the only NHL player that didn't get vaccinated, which I yeah, I'm well. st I still hold that against him. Yeah, you know, I mean, and and I think, but you said the big thing. He's never healthy, and I think he's far more replaceable than Larkin is. It's easier to find a Bertuzzi replacement than it is course. replacing number one center. Of course, absolutely. Of course, there is. Um, and Bertuzzi just you know, he's always hurt. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not his fault. I mean, it's not, yeah. he's not trying to get hurt, yeah. but he, the facts of the, I mean, I, I just don't know how you gauge him. I don't know how yeah. you, uh, um, um, evaluate him. Yeah. Uh, this year, I, you really, you can't even evaluate. I think he's played what, how many games has he played? 15, 10? I don't even know how many <laughs> yeah. games he's played this year. Yeah. How do you, how do you evaluate this guy? I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, somebody on Twitter, our good friend uh, Nick Milanovic, said, "Well, maybe yeah. they should just trade him." I said, "Well, what are you going to get for him?" Yeah, you're you trading on. Yeah, the value is low right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're going to get low, low draft picks. You're, or I mean, you might get a, uh, you know, a, a, a third line forward and a, some low draft pick. You're not going to get anything. Yeah, you know, he's he's another guy. He's going to be 28 in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, he okay. Let's look at it. Uh, he has played 15 games this year. Yeah. Two years ago, he played nine games. Right. Okay. Cause he was hurt. He missed those games last year. A lot of them were because of, like you said, the can't go to Canada thing. Uh, you look at, I, I'm, I'm looking at his, his, his numbers on hockey reference and I'm, I'm just not blown away. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not blown away. I mean, I, I, these are the kind of guys. I think he's really, when you think about it, he's only had like one standout year, I'm thinking. And that would have been like 2019, maybe. Well, 20, yeah. 20, 2022, he scored 30. He scored yeah. 30 last year. Right. 20, he scored 21 goals twice before, but then he was hurt. Yeah. yeah. Missed almost the entire 21 season. And then it's, he's only played 15 games. He's one goal in 15 games this year. So yeah. where do you, how do you evaluate this guy? I don't know. Right. I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't, he's 28, going to be 28, you know, before he know it, he'll be 30. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I agree with you. I, I don't, I don't see much incentive to bring him back at all whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If that, if that, the, you know, if you're, yeah, that that's a guy I can see them moving on from. And yes, if that means you trade him, you get maybe a second or third round pick, then so be it. Because right. I, I can't see him being worth the money that he would want. He was going to ask being a, a top six forward. I mean, we're seeing it right now that the Wings are, you know, I think they're having second thoughts of Jacob Varna, who was put on waivers a couple of weeks ago, right. and they could have lost him for nothing. If someone yeah. had decided to pick up his contract, but yeah. no, they didn't. So he's still in Grand Rapids after his conditioning resigned. Now he's essentially just on a Grand Rapids roster. No, and we've seen it now with the uh, Dolkovic as well, who has been put on who was put on waivers. No one picked him up, and he struggled mightily. We've talked about him in the past on the podcast, and yeah. it looks like uh, the Wings have said, "Well, we just we figured out he is what he is, and we don't see the future of Nadelkovic. And they're so they're just riding the 
their backup goalie is another uh, uh, oh, uh, Helberg. Or was yeah, Helberg. Marcus Helberg was another journeyman, but he's outplayed Novelkovic, and obviously Huso is right now proven to be the man in, in goal. Well, here's the thing. Here, and I, I remember talking about this earlier in the year, and I remember saying to you mm-hmm. uh, when we talked about Huso, and I said, well, Huso's been fant- at the time, he was fantastic. Yeah. And I said, well, you know what? Mm-hmm. I don't know that, you know, I, I said, don't forget that Huso yeah. wasn't this whole goaltending situation when, mm-hmm. when when they brought Huso in was designed to be kind of a 50 50 split. Yeah, you're right. You know, that Huso mm-hmm. would play 45 games, maybe, and mm-hmm. the Dukovic would pay, play the rest. Yeah. Because when they got enough Delkovich, that he was supposed to be the guy that was going to play all the, all the time. Right. He was going to be, you know, okay. So now, and I remember saying when Delkovich was struggling, I said, I, you know, I don't know that Huso. He's never played this many games before. Yeah. And, and and indeed, if you now his overall numbers look okay. Mm-hmm. But if you look at his numbers, I'm talking about Huso now. Yeah. If you look at his numbers from let's say mid December on, mm-hmm. they've been pedestrian. They've yeah. been pedestrian. Why? Because I think that the, the workload is such that he's it's catching up to him. Yeah, he's already. I, I, this, this is his thirty third game of the he year. He wasn't meant. He yeah. wasn't expected to play fifty or sixty games, which is what he's yeah. going to end up playing. Yeah, I just looked up the numbers. He's projected <laughs> as of right now to play fifty six games. Yeah, you know, that you you can't do that in today's NHL. Well, I mean, you can unless I mean, they're, unless they're, it's like you know it's Dominic Hasek or something. You know, I mean, no, you you there are guys that can do that. But what I'm saying is that you know last year he played forty for. Uh, St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, he played 17 for St. Louis. Yeah. Okay. Now he, he's going to play, like you said, 56 games at least. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking at his numbers right now. Okay. His numbers right now are are okay. They're just okay. Yeah. yeah. Look at look where his numbers were in before Thanksgiving. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right around that time, he yeah. was in the low twos with his goals against. He was in the in the nine tens and nine twenties in the save percentage. Yeah. Now he's nine oh one, which is basically like a zero war goalie. Right. He's three point oh three GAA, which is yep. again zero war goalie. Mm-hmm. His numbers scream zero war goalie right now. Yeah. Why? Because his numbers have tanked. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk about that because everybody's talking about Nadelkovic. I've seen a couple of writers say, mm-hmm. acknowledge, finally acknowledge. You know, Huso, don't look now, but Huso, I don't know, lately, yeah. because he's played so many games. Yeah. And I know he's only 27 years old, but still, I mean, there's a there's a different, it's different, playing playing goal, 56 yeah. games. You say goalies are different, and they age differently. You're right. Right. Yeah. right. So I'm not saying that, that, that Huso's going to fall off the cliff necessarily, but all I'm saying is that, the, and I, I mentioned this, and I, I wrote a piece, uh, yesterday mm-hmm. about the, the Red Wings inconsistency. And I said, the goaltending depth in this organization has really been a disappointment. It's, it's really yeah. taken a turn. Yeah. There, there was a time where it looked really pretty good. It mm-hmm. looked like the Red Wings could, could sustain themselves and wait for something to happen in the yeah. low minors and with draft picks and wait for those guys to, and I think you you said it too. I think we had Kenny mm-hmm. Cal on and you said that, you know, goalies just sometimes take a long time to kind of really yeah. develop. Yeah, a twenty-seven-year-old goalie is young. A right. Twenty-seven-year-old right. forward is in his prime. So it looked yeah. right. So it looked like it looked like that the Red Wings were going to be with Nedeljkovic and Huso. We're going to be able to, and with uh, anybody else they had in in in, in Grand Rapids, look like they were going to be able to withstand mm-hmm. waiting for any youngsters that were coming yeah. through the pike. Uh, they, they, they had that, that one kid who's a million feet tall that's in the system right now. Right. But, you know, they, were, they looked like they were going to be able to to, to kind of hold the fort down mm-hmm. while they wait. You know, okay. Well, that hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, nobody expe- – I don't know what happened to Nadelka. Nadel- Nadel- I really don't because everybody mm-hmm. – uh, nobody saw this coming, really. Yeah. And I, and I, and I know that when it comes <clears> – <throat> excuse me, when it comes to goaltenders, it doesn't it, – once the goal – once the confidence it takes yeah. a few hits, it's hard to – some guys handle it okay and they bounce back. Mm-hmm. Some guys don't. Some guys they go into that funk. Yeah, and they never really get. I remember they Schmuck remind me of relief pitchers. You're, yeah, at, at a right. certain level, you just don't know for sure what you're going to get from year to year. You know, you, okay. Even a guy like Rogie Vashon, okay, yeah. who the Red Wings brought in. Now Rogie was 33. Probably should have done it. Should have signed it to begin with. But you still brought him in. He was 33. He was coming up. He was still good when he his numbers were okay when when they when they signed him, 
he was an all-world goalie, essentially, a world-class goalie for, for yeah. many years for the Kings. Okay. He had a rough, rough, rough start as the Red Wing and never recovered. Yeah. Never really recovered. He never really did. And I know part of it was his age, for mm-hmm. sure. But his numbers mm-hmm. just were ridiculously well, it's a goal actually, that remember gets the worse. Hate for Curtis Joseph? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the the fan base never bought into him after a certain point. Even right. though he, even though he's a legitimate, he was a legitimate upper upper tier goalie. Just didn't work out in Detroit. You know, all these guys they start fighting the puck. Yeah, Hashik in yeah. 2008 when mm-hmm. the Red Wings did win the Stanley Cup, they started. A lot of people forget they started that playoff run with Hashik and, and finished the Fozzy. Right. And yep. the, and 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 after like three or four games of the Nashville series, mm-hmm. Babcock said I, the puck's going in the net too much. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I I'm sorry. I don't care mm-hmm. that you're a Hall of Famer. Yep. I don't care that you're. And now Babcock was one of, probably one of the few coaches that could have done this, but right. he said, "Look, I don't care what your credentials are. Mm-hmm. The puck the puck is going in the net. Yeah, and that's that can't happen in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So they gave he gave Osgood in Osgood's first game. I remember in that series was an overtime win where he made mm-hmm. up some big saves either late in regulation or mm-hmm. in overtime to save mm-hmm. the game. And from there, from that point on, he was the guy, and they won the Stanley Cup. Yeah, I would submit to you that they don't win the Stanley Cup if Babcock doesn't make that change. They, yeah, not I, even, yeah. they probably wouldn't have even gotten out of the Nashville series if he didn't make right. that change. So it just goes to show you that it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. How much cash you bring to the table? Yeah. If you you start to lose your confidence as a goalie, it's hard to get it back. Yeah, yeah. You know, and just looking at Ozzy right now, it looks like he can still play goal. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look like he's aged a bit when on the pregame shows. I know. I know. <laughs> All right, one more quick topic so we can wrap it up. We need to touch on the Tigers. So they made a big trade while we were off. Oh, well, wait a second. Oh, question three of the birthday game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, 1964, 1990 World Series winner, 1990 NLCS MVP, uh, hothead, uh, two-time All-Star, got into trouble for throwing the ball into the stands one time, striking a girl, a woman, uh, just known for doing a lot of, he was in brawls all the oh, time. Oh, wouldn't it be Mitch Williams? No, not no, Mitch Williams. No, no, no. Not it's, it's, Mitch Williams. Or is this the, what's it, uh, what's it, who, who are we talking about here? Rob Dibble. Right. Oh, 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 yes. Of the, of the Reds. Yes. Yes. Ah, well, like I said, at least I don't have to worry about getting my, uh, my ham license from the government now. So <laughs> that's the first time in a while you've stumped me. You really have. It is. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Speaking of baseball, we need to wrap this up. Yeah. Tigers dealt Greg Risotto to the Phillies, Greg. And essentially in return, they got their bench. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they really did. Um, uh, <laughs> Scott Harris sent Greg Risotto, the t- 27-year-old closer. Closer, I would put in, you know, in yeah. exclam- you know, exclamation points right. because we've both seen a lot of Soto. He is what he is, and he's not right. trustworthy. Regardless, he's a two-time All-Star because someone has to be. Right. And also, right. they threw in Cody Clemens, their utility man, and they get, got in return a 26-year-old right-hand hitting outfielder in Matt Vierling, a 25-year-old left-handed hitting infielder in Nick Maton or Maton, I'm not sure how it's pronounced yet, and a 25-year-old deaf catcher uh, spent most of his time in the minor leagues in Donnie Sands. It looks like uh, uh, Maton and Veerling are going to both be uh, on the roster to start the season. Uh, Maton has the more experience. Veerling has the more upside. And both these guys are on the postseason roster for the Phillies. So it's not like they were getting guys that, they're, these aren't lottery tickets. These are legit major league ball players. It's just that is not yet sure what level of ball player they're going to be. If they, I'll say this: if they end up sliding into the Castro's role, that's a win, you know, because both these guys are better than Harold and Willie Castro. But I think what uh, Harris is betting on, at least one of these guys, probably Verling. Becomes a starting outfield. It becomes a starter. So I, I'm not uptight about the. I, I saw a lot of the pendants out there saying, "Oh, the Phillies stole Soto." I'm, I'm thinking, did these guys watch the Tigers play? Oh yeah, they didn't. Obviously not. Play. Obviously not. Yeah, because Soto is what he is. He, he throws 100 miles an hour. He's a lefty who throws 100, so he's going to get a lot of chances. But if his slider isn't working, and it didn't work at all last year. He's extremely hittable. I mean, Greg, how many closers have 11 losses? 
you know, you can say what you will about wins and losses and the big, you know, it's it's a team game and all that. But the only time Soda was effective with the Tigers is if you brought him in in the ninth inning, nobody on base, and they had a two or three run lead. Other than that, it was like a coin flip as to which Soto you were going to get. So I'm not upset about the trade of Soto. It's just a matter is his hair is going to be right about the upside of the players he got. Right. I I, I tweeted out. I said uh, I hope the Phillies fans are going to are are ready for a bunch of three one two and zero and three one counts. Yeah, because that's exactly. what this guy does. He comes in. He's it's not like he it doesn't. It's not like he comes into the game and starts pumping the strike zone. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not like that. You know, it takes 25 pitches to get him through the ninth inning half the time. Um, and you're you're dead on about the two-time All-Star thing, because yeah. you're right. With, every, with everybody, every team having to have a representative and so forth. No, I'm not upset by losing Soto whatsoever. No. The, 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 line, the line. The Tigers are not <clears> – <throat> their fate is not going to be determined about whether or not they have Gregory Soto in the no. bullpen. But their long-term fate could be determined by how these kids that they got back perform. Yeah. Yeah, these um, the, these two and the kid they got from Atlanta earlier in the year. Exactly. Well, here's the, here's what's so funny about this though. Uh, I I guess times have changed, Al, because yeah. I I remember uh, right after this trade was made, and and um, uh, our friend Lee Panis said mm-hmm. uh, on Twitter, he said, you know, these are these guys fit the the Scott Harris type of ball player. They draw mm-hmm. walk. He this is his what Panis said. He said they yeah. draw walks. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the numbers. And now I maybe I'm old school, but when I mm-hmm. hear draw walks, I think of a guy who gets 100 walks a year or 90 mm-hmm. to 100 walks a year or a walk every six plate appearances. Mm-hmm. Well, neither of these guys, these guys, Vierling and, and Maiden were like projecting like getting like 40 or 50 walks a year. I'm like, is that drawing walks? I guess I guess times have changed. If that's mm-hmm. considered drawing walks, and I looked at their on base. Well, on, a, on this Tigers roster, it is drawing. Well, yeah, walks. I, but and I looked at their on base, but I, I also looked at their on base percentage. Yeah, and, and, I, not, and I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not seeing it now. Now Harris was, you know, uh, effusive in his praise mm-hmm. for these guys and how athletic Veerling is, and 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 they 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 control the strikes and whatever that means. Where they, they control the strike zone, which uh, or command yeah. the strike zone. Right. And I'm like, well, what does that? I, what does that mean? I mean, mm-hmm. they're still both projected to, to strike out 90 to 100 times a year. But again, I guess times have changed. I guess that's mm-hmm. just. And I so I, he obviously doesn't. He, Minnie Harris, obviously isn't looking just at what I'm looking at, which are his their baseball reference uh, entry. Right. He's looking at he's he's actually watching them play. I mean that's mm-hmm. I mean, that's obviously that's that's worth a lot too. Right. But I from a statistical standpoint, <coughs> I didn't see and I and I went back at Lee and I said, uh, is this considered drawing walks nowadays? And he kind of said what you said, which mm-hmm. is well, if you compare it to what what the Tigers have, he says then basically and then somebody else chimed in and said, well, you know, I hate to tell you this, but. That's that's the new that's the new normal now in the and MLB mm-hmm. is that guys are striking out 125 times a year, mm-hmm. drawing 40 walks a year, and that's just the way it is. So when you can find a guy who is even a little bit better in either in either of those categories, that's yeah. considered, you know, you're doing better than average. So right, I, but I I just again I, to me it's I so I thought that on base percentage was still an important statistic, and neither of these guys have really strong on base percentages. Uh, but again, I guess it comes down to tools and yeah. minor league right. stats. Yeah. Because no, regardless, their no, big league numbers are still pretty limited, I think. No, I know. Uh, Matan, I know. I know. what's it, Maiton, Matan? Yeah. He only has well, like yeah. about 200 big league at bats. And yeah, no, I, I know. Bats, I get it. So. I get it. But yeah, I do I get what you're saying, though, that, yeah, these guys, that's what we're being sold on. But we'll have to be, we'll have to see if they live up to the billing. One more thing. Tigers are finally going to move in Comerica's Park's center field wall, making Lynn Hanning a very happy man. <laughs> he's he's railed on that for deck for over a decade. Yeah. Uh, they're also going to lower the walls in center field and right field. Essentially, the uh, that were that the giant wall in the power alley in right center is going to be dropped from 13 feet to seven. Uh, wow. Center field is coming in 10 feet to 412. Then also the right field and center field walls are also essentially the wall is going to be seven feet all the way around now. So. Right. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference home run wise, but apparently all the players are thrilled by this. And I think it's more, it's one of those, it's kind of, maybe it's the placebo effect here where it might add only a handful of home runs per year, but 
you know, you're more, I guess it's the idea you're going to be re- more, you're going to be rewarded for a hard hit ball more. It'll be a more regular occurrence. You're not going to have 420 foot outs anymore. I you know I see a lot of fans. Oh, you should build the team around the park. Mm-hmm. That ship has sailed that, you know, the, the you, you can't build the 1980 uh, St. Louis Cardinals anymore. That's not going to win games, you know, because I think that's what people expect. You know, oh, you have, you have a big park. Well, let's just get a bunch of Willie McGee's, you know. It doesn't work that way. Willie McGee's. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so you know, I think – I don't think it's that big a deal. I do think that if the players are for it, then great. And I've always thought that, yeah, that right center field is too deep. So even if you can't bring it in, at least shrink the wall a little bit. You know, it's really in the end is not that big of a deal. But uh, it, it is funny. This is the second time that they've changed the dimensions of this park in 20 years. Well, back in 2007, when yeah. Curtis Granderson hit, I think like 23 or 24 triples, okay, yeah. playing in playing in Comerica Park. Why? Because of he took advantage of those gaps. Yeah. He punched the ball, he sprayed the ball into the gaps, and mm-hmm. he ran like the wind. And so he got he was getting a lot of triples. Yeah. And then he went now, to New York and hit 40 home runs because right, of short port. Because he played at <laughs> Bandbox, right? Yeah. But now it's all about launch angle, and it's all about yeah. it's it's not about hitting line drives anymore. It really no, isn't. You're right. Walks and home runs. Right. Yeah. Uh, GMs and presidents and uh, personnel and all the people that are involved in developing players, they mm-hmm. want launch angles now. Yeah. So what's happening mm-hmm. is that the, the the ballpark that Granderson played in that when he got the 23 triples is the mm-hmm. same ballpark essentially that they have right now. It's the same dimensions, same alley, same fence yeah. height, the whole nine yards. Okay. Well, the difference being that Granderson, the way he – forget the New York thing. Before yeah. he went to New York, mm-hmm. he was – driving the ball on the on a line right and he was you know placing it between the right and center fielder or the left and center fielder Mm -hmm. and in running forever right now with launch angles all the rage Mm -hmm. guys aren't hitting triples into that same alley they're hitting long fly outs outs. that okay and that and that's the thing is it's a different type of mentality it's a different type of hitter now Mm -hmm. and so what you see and you don't even have to have uh, Great outfielders, by the way, to play mm-hmm. out there. I mean, an average outfielder is going to get to those balls. Okay, mm-hmm. if, they're, if they're high enough in the air, yeah. I mean, unless you're you're lugging a piano on your back, you're going to mm-hmm. get to those balls. Okay, so that's why you see a lot of long flyouts in Comerica Park, as opposed to the Grandersons of the world who are gone. Those yeah. those kind of players are gone. You know, mm-hmm. they don't have those kind of guys anymore. Nobody wants mm-hmm. those guys anymore. They want the home run hitters and the launch angle guys. So this is going to help. In the sense that that's where today's big league player is all yeah. about. Yeah, it's and not players necess- that are coming up and how they're all the, right. the the young players are being developed this way. And right. now, it, will it will it will it affect any potential free agents that they, they come? Maybe I don't know. I mean, maybe uh, or better. Maybe the better question is: just, Did it dissuade any free agents from coming to Detroit? Free agent hitters from coming to Detroit, uh, like you know, the whole Juan Gonzalez effect. Of course, or, and, Gonzalez and, uh, played, yeah, or the uh, the Castellanos before. who railed about right. the park, right? Yeah. And uh, well, the other guy that they the guy from Minnesota that they traded, uh, uh Robbie Grossman, was Grossman, one. yeah. Okay, well, that that so now they they take that out of the equation, and um, mm-hmm. but you know, how much it's going to impact wins and losses is probably negligible, yeah, but... exactly. It's still going to be a league average park, essentially, yeah, right, yeah. 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 But, you know, it's interesting to I just thought this goes to show just how they screwed it up in the begin with when they built that st- when they built that park, that they've had to change the dimensions twice now to keep continually bring in fences or, you know, yes. Remember how big that place used to be before they put the bullpen in left oh. field? and all that? It was ridiculous. It's punitive. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's the perfect word for it. All right. With that, let's get out of here. Who's your jerk of the week? Well, my jerk of the week is we touched on, it, but we really didn't dive into it, is NBC Sports mm-hmm. uh, for their performance uh, on Sunday Night Football when the Lions yeah. went into Green Bay. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned you touched on it briefly. You said it was all about Aaron Rodgers, and it was. Um, now they they the Lions did get some props during the game itself because they were they won the game I and mean, they were they were making the plays and they okay. But my beef with NBC Sports was the what happened after the game. Now the Lions win the game. Knocked the Packers out of the playoffs. Cap 
a wonderful ending to their season, go into Green Bay, win a game that nobody thought they were going to win. And all you saw at the end of the game was Aaron Rodgers. There was a single shot of Aaron Rodgers on the screen for I don't know how many minutes of him talking to other players, congratulating other players, getting congratulated, walking off the field with Randall Cobb. Uh, even Mike Tirico, who was a Michigan guy, said, well, the Lions won the game. But the real story here is Aaron Rodgers. I'm like, what? Now, if Aaron Rodgers had flat out come out and said, This this is my last year. This is it, guys. No matter how whether we make the playoffs or not, this is my last year. I'm retiring. Okay, I can kind of buy it because now then now that's literally his last game. That's literally his last game ever. We didn't know that. We don't know. We still don't know that. We we don't know if he'll be back with the Packers. We don't know if he'll be playing for another team, but what we do know is I'm pretty sure he's not going to retire. Okay. So their treatment of this post game with it all being about Rogers was ridiculous. Absolutely. It is a flat out say on national TV. It's not about the lions. Screw the lions. This is about Aaron Rodgers. This is about it. I, I was really, really disappointed. So my jerk of the week is NBC sports. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, the end of that game, they literally just had a camera on Rodgers and followed yeah. him in all the way through the damn tunnel. I know. I know. It was know. Little, it was ridiculous. God you know, and the almighty. only way you got any Lions content, the team that won and outplayed them, is if you, you had to go on the Peacock for the post game to see this stuff. So well, they literally, yeah. they, Mike Tirico literally said, literally said. Well, the Lions won the game, but that's not the story. Yeah, right. The story is Aaron Rodgers. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. my God. Yeah. No, Mike, the story is, is the Lions. The story is the fact that they won eight out of ten games, beat the Packers in Green Bay, knocked the Packers out of the playoffs, won a game that nobody thought they were going to win, mm-hmm. changed the totally changed their, their season around. That's the story. And shame yeah. on Mike Tirico. Maybe I should make the jerk of Mike Tirico. Shame on Mike Tirico for being a Michigan native, by the way. Yep. He lives mm-hmm. here in the off season. Yep. Shame on him. He should know better. He knows the, the history of the Lions. He knows what the, the fan base is all about. And I'm not saying he had to, he had to cater to the Lions fan base. Mm-hmm. All he had to do was, uh, was just, the, that was the story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's some Aaron Rodgers stuff in there. Sure. But the fact that they beat Aaron Rodgers was also the story. And mm-hmm. I just, I, I, I'm, I can't believe it. I really can't. Mm-hmm. So that, that's my jerk of the week. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give it to Tariko. I'm going to give yeah. it to Tariko. If any, yeah, right. If anybody should know better, it's him. That's for right. Him. That's what, right. Of the national media. Yeah, exactly. All right. I'm going to st- keep my, my jerk of the week. I'm going to stick with NBC sports. Okay. And, but I'm going with Tony Dungy who once again has proven to be a virulent homophobe. Uh, the late, oh, no, well, not even that. It's, it's just, he's very, uh, well, I'll put it this way. The, we, if you if you paid any attention, there is an urban legend going on out there that says that in schools today, they put kitty litter in bathrooms because it allows kids to dress as furries and act like cats, which is, of course, completely, complete bullshit. They put kitty litter in some rooms because of they were afraid that they had to barricade themselves in a, in, a, in a shooting incident, they needed to relieve themselves in something. That's what the kitty litter was for. So, it's of course, conservatives have taken a run with this, saying it's because of, uh, uh, you know, because of, of pronouns and LGBTQ and, you know, and, uh, and grooming and all this bullshit. Well, Tony Dungy said just uh, who his long has a history of being a homophobe this, going back years he's a guy who said he wouldn't have drafted michael sam when he came out when michael sam was the first uh, college player to be drafted and admitted you know and came out in the open as he was gay and dungy said oh i wouldn't draft him you know i caused problems but that's the thing dungy is a is a fundamentalist christian which says volumes right there and he and when it came out to the kitty litter thing he popularized it again. He brought it out and said, essentially, this is his tweet. State school districts are putting litter boxes in school bathrooms for the students who identify as cats. Very important to address every student's needs. Sarcastically, he says. What a fucking idiot. Now, 30 seconds of research would show you this has been long debunked. And the thing is, Dungy has a history of this because he is 
you know, he is essentially a Bible thumper, anti, uh, you know, anti-gay, anti anything that's not heterosexual. And guys like him are, are a reason why we have these issues in sports. And what's worse is that NBC, he, uh, he did ultimately apologize for it. One of those, I'm sorry if you've offended, you know, if you've been offended, blah, blah, blah. Right. But yeah. the problem is, is that in, this is not the first time he's said crap like this. And yet NBC continues to allow him to be on the air. And what's worse, he's a lousy broadcaster. Yeah. He he did the, uh, I believe, one of the wild card games with uh, Al Michaels, who was uh, Al Michaels, what, 80 years old at this point? He's still he's not he's still OK, but he's not the Al Michaels he used to be. And it, Tony Dungy brings nothing to a broadcast at this right, point. Right, he, right. You know, he's he brings nothing original. He right. brings nothing controversial. Other than these, these religious viewpoints, right? So he brings nothing to a broadcast. I I'm, I still can't believe the guys on the air. NBC keeps trotting them out, and he keeps spewing anti-gay rhetoric. And yet, here we are. He's still he's you know he's still going to be on the NBC broadcast. My jerk of the week is Tony Dungy and NBC for he, he's essentially a homophobe. He's a he's a hateful person, and we need less people like him in the world. So agreed. Well said. Yeah. All right. With that, Greg, why don't you get out the thank yous and what we can look forward to on cu- upcoming shows? Well, hey, um, it's uh, it was great to see City Hall again. Thanks, yes, thanks yes. to him. Um, and we really didn't do an intro to City. I just realized, but <laughs> we'll, <laughs> sure figure it, it we'll figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah, you'll snap it together. But basically, good good to see uh, City. Uh, in two weeks, we hope to have uh, Coach Creighton on from, uh, from Eastern Michigan to talk about his very successful season. Yeah. I want to uh, remind everybody to follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno. Follow Knee Jerks on Twitter at the Knee Jerks and read me and my WordPress Out of Bounds blog uh, pretty much every week. I have two columns mm-hmm. this week. Yeah. Yesterday was about the Red Wings and uh, wrote a piece today about Chris Ford, the late Chris Ford who passed away last week, and about his yeah. big steal uh, in 1976. So uh, check that out, please. And mm-hmm. I want to thank my lovely wife, Sharon, and thank you. Uh, Big Al for making Tuesday night so gosh darn fun. Yes, and th- thank you, Greg, for um, just being you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, but seriously, it's glad to, I'm glad to be back. I did miss doing a show while I was in Florida. Uh, I'll give a shout out to our listeners who putting up for our sometimes extended absences due to life gets in the way because neither one of us are getting any younger. We do have outside interests other than our podcast. We're not, we're not quite what we were when we first started the show. I'll say that for damn sure. Uh, I'll give a shout. And also, um, I, you know, I really got nothing at this point. So uh, I guess it, right now I'll just start to wrap things up. So uh, plus we've run way long. This is going to be a long podcast. But yeah. that's what happens when you're off the air for a month. So yeah. with that, I think we just need to get the hell out of here because I'm hemming and hawing enough. So until this time, two weeks from now, we'll probably have uh, – We'll have uh, probably lots more trade talk when it comes to the NBA and the NHL. Other than that, we'll see what happens. So until that time, this is Al Beaton saying good evening, good luck, and aloha. Ciao, Italy. We'll see you in two weeks.